Uh, I'm Tim. I'm also a graduate student here in the department. Thank you all for coming. Um, so Manuel, I don't know where he went, but Manuel, uh, there he is, uh, was talking to us about many different things. I'm introducing the, the topic, and I'm going to focus on, on violence. Um, we're going to start with a video to kind of set the kind of set the scene about what we're talking about because we're going to talk about violence in video games and like the social reaction to it so this will be much more of a of an active uh segment of the of the symposium so at the end i'll have several questions that i hope will uh spark discussion maybe not debate but certainly discussion about um video games, not video games role in society so much, but um, the, the effects of, of violence and what we think video, the violence in video games, how that affects society and what we think society in general thinks about that. And then we'll take a look at um, what um, people who study this type of thing, what they have to say about violence in video games. Okay, so we're going to take a look at this video. It's a couple minutes. Uh, kind of set the stage a little bit. has come out to say that the real problem isn't guns, but instead violent video games. So we wanted to know, is there really a connection between virtual violence and real-world violence? ABC's Neil Karlinski got some answers. Thomas Pantig and Stephen Lloyd are typical of many in their generation. Good jobs by day, obsessed with a violent so-called first-person shooter called Call of Duty when they get home. But is this just good fun, or is an entire generation being trained and desensitized to the act of shooting people? And then some people just go crazy. Dr. Chris Ferguson has conducted a series of multi-year studies of 11 to 18-year-olds to find out what violent games do to them. There's no evidence to suggest that exposure to violent video games uh, is associated with violent criminal behavior. But Dr. Victor Strasberger says today's video games are more real, more intense than anything that's come before. Kids spend an incredible amount of time with the media. They see increasingly violent media. Why in this country would we spend $250 billion a year on advertising if we didn't think advertising affected people? So whose research to believe? Who to judge? The U.S. Supreme Court already has. In striking down California's attempt at a violent video game law, the court had this to say. These studies have been rejected by every court to consider them, and with good reason. They do not prove that violent video games cause minors to act aggressively. Bonnie Ross, a mother of two young children with her own concerns, also happens to run one of the most successful first-person shooter games around, Halo 4. What do you say to parents who worry it's, it's too violent, it's not good for the kids? What I recommend is your kids are going to play games, play it with them, you know, so that you can really be there to answer questions and, and help them do that. Advice from an insider, whether you like it or not, kids are playing these games and it's up to the parents to understand them. Neil Karlinski, ABC News, Seattle. I don't know what I do. Okay, so when when we're talking about violent video games, I think a lot of people think about, and certainly what comes to my mind, are are the shooter games, right? That's certainly what I tend to think of, and I'm coming from the perspective of someone who never really played video games. I w um, and we, we saw the statistics that Manuel showed us earlier, and it certainly seems to show that most you know, most children, young people are playing video games, and I think that was my experience growing up. That most people I knew were were playing video games of, of different types. I can remember, you know, in in high school, or yeah, high school for example, you know, going to friends' houses and kind of feeling the need to participate. I can actually remember playing, um, um, like Halo for example, which was a very popular game in the early 2000s, mid 2000s. I can remember playing that. Um, and I can, I can remember, you know, my, my brothers as well. I, I have three brothers, and they all play video games. So that certainly supports the statistics my mom talked about. And the, the interesting thing was that these video games were generally had, did, had violent content in them. Generally, they were combat-based games. Um, but I, never, I certainly never saw anything that led me to believe that these games cause, uh, cause violence. 
or have much to do with it. But um, it was certainly it was certainly interesting to see that most people I knew were playing games, video games, and they almost always had had some sort of violent content in them. So we saw the video we just watched had um, what we could classify as a pretty run-of-the-mill uh, reaction to to violence in video games. And here we have you know nowadays and in, in this century this this year right around now and this is a typical 20th century reaction right people saying that these video games encourage active participation um, they're excellent teaching tools but unfortunately in many popular video games the behavior is is, is violent so it's, it's teaching people how to engage in violence now this is this is a you know a typical reaction this is from 2013 Okay, from a professor at the University of, of Missouri. So a typical reaction that we could find today. Okay, and here's another example, another typical reaction to violent content in media. This is a story in the Telegraph of London that talks of the arrest of a young burglar who confessed that he was led into crime by reading a book, The Life of a de 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 Detective. And that's what, that's what he said. And the, the story goes on to talk about, as a matter of fact, the book seems to have stimulated rather than weakened the criminal propensities of the precocious student. Detective literature is injurious. And it is curious that detective stories are among the favorite books of youthful criminals. So this is a story from a, from a newspaper in London. The only difference is, this is from a different century. This is from 1890. So as far as our reactions go, um, related to violent content in media, they don't seem to have changed much in 120 years. Okay, so combat-based games, we should talk about some of the, the different types of combat-based games we have. Um, so we have fighting games, uh, certainly Mortal Kombat is one I can remember from way back when I was, for me, that was, I was quite young. Uh, once again, I can remember friends playing it mostly Mortal Kombat, it was a fighting game, you know, you'd, each person would control a character, and there was hand-to-hand -hand combat. We have hack and slash games, which you can imagine what that refers to from the name, hacking and slashing your way through many levels. of Action adventure games, such as the Legend of Zelda series, you have survival horror, and shooter games, first person, third person shooter games. Um, and I, I, I don't know if, when, when you all think of Violent content in video games. When you think of violence in video games, do you think of shooter games? Is that generally the first person you can see the gun sticking out from your perspective and you're, right? That's generally what I think of when, when, I, when I think of a shooter game. So that seems to be, the other games um, not so, aren't as, I don't know if they're not as popular now, but it certainly seems that shooter games are, are very popular. Okay, what are the attractions of, of violent entertainment because violence very obviously is not only found in, in this medium, it's found in all media. Um, we find it in, in television, movies, books, everything. Why? Well, they, they create imaginary worlds, right, these, these things, and I, I think my personal opinion is that in, in every media, in, in every medium, we all, we, we're looking for conflict, right? We're looking for some, without conflict, there is no story, really. We need a conflict, we need a resolution. And so the violence, in a way, um, gives people that. Okay, it's an abstraction of the real world. And it gives people excitement and adrenaline. It gives them that the feeling of adrenaline that I think people really crave. Thinking back to, to my brothers or my friends, I, you know, they, they would play, they would get so into the games, you know, it was Call of Duty, Medal of Honor, whatever it is they were playing. You know, my, my two brothers would sit up in the attic at night and they would play this for hours. And they'd be online playing with other people, other teams of people online that could have been anywhere around the country or around the world. And sometimes they would get so into it that especially my youngest brother, who's a, kind of a big scary guy, he would he would yell and pound the ground, and I swear that on the first floor you could, you could hear it. It was that scary. It sounded like the, the thunder from last night. The snow thunder. So I, I see that. I see the excitement. I see the, the adrenaline. I, I've definitely seen it firsthand. I'm sure anyone who's seen these games, um, or played the games even, because I would, you know, whenever I was suckered into playing Halo, 
I would always, when I, I'd never, I'd always be killed. Okay, and I, I could, but I could feel the, the adrenaline, I could feel that excitement, even though I wasn't doing anything worthwhile for my team. And it gives us a feeling of companionship, right? You're playing on a team with people. If they're with you physically in the room, or if you're playing as my brothers do now, they play on the same team, but they live in California, Pennsylvania, and different places. And they still play together online. So it's a form of social acceptance as well. Like I said, if you're the person, like me, who, who doesn't play, well, then you're kind of the odd man out. Also, we like to see justice enacted. That's another reason people tend to, um, tend to enjoy violent uh, video games and, and media in general, see justice enacted. And also, this article by Jeffrey Goldstein talks about masculine identity and the fact that engaging in these sorts of things and this sort of media is a, an affirmation of masculine identity. And this is a way that, we, uh, that, that young men can, can reaffirm that. Okay, so let's look at some examples that maybe we've all heard of. These are two, I, I think, for me anyway, two of the most popular two I've certainly heard of. We have the Grand Theft Auto series, which I can remember from when I was a lot younger because it came out in 1997, which has been out for a long time now. And this is an example of an open world game. And I, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think it, it's getting more and more developed to the point where you can interact with so many different aspects of the gameplay. And I think that people have a problem with that because you're not, you, you don't necessarily have to, your acts of violence don't have to go towards you completing the mission. It could be completely, I don't want to say gratuitous, but it could be, you could act out violence in any, any way you saw fit. And it's been criticized for its violent as well as its sexual content. We have the Call of Duty series. It's uh, debuted in 2004. It started as a World War II combat game, and I think it's moved more and more modern. And this is a game where, of course, it had missions and, and things, missions to accomplish in a, a game, the game you could win. But then I, from what I saw, in my experience, it was mainly people enjoyed playing the, I don't know, what you, the multiplayer online, the, that part where you would play against other people on the internet. Okay, now we have two more examples. We have, I'll start here with the, the Postal series, which started, again, in the late 90s. It's another first and third person shooter that, from what I read, really seems to lack in a lot, I don't, I don't know if it lacks uh, objectives, but it's, it seemed to be that it was very much open world and, and gamers could, could really um, commit acts of violence on any other, like any character in the game. And that was you know, a, lot of, a lot of controversy because of that. But there wasn't as much controversy as with the game on the left, Six Days in Fallujah. Um, and you can see the picture on the picture says, should this be a game? It asks that question. This was a game that, in, that was being um, developed in 2004. It was based on an actual, an actual battle, that, the second battle of Fallujah. And Konami, which is a, is a very big name in video game production, was producing the game. And it came under a lot of fire uh, due to the fact that it was based on a real battle where you know, soldiers had, had actually died and it was very fresh in, fresh in the memory. And in 2009, under immense pressure, Konami actually dropped the game and it hasn't been released. It hasn't even been finished as far as I know. So those are two more examples. Okay, so are video games the culprit? Do video games cause violence? Well, the, the closest thing to that statement I could find was something along the lines of this, uh, short-term violence. It, it can kind of stir hostile urges, as the New York Times put it, and mildly aggressive behavior, but in the short term. And I couldn't find anything that, that at all about anything longer term, producing longer term effects. So uh, youngsters who develop a gaming habit can become slightly more uh, aggressive, at least over a period of year or two, of a year or two. So it, it seems to be, if at all, it, and I, wouldn't, I don't even know if it could, a year or two if I'm very convinced by that, but maybe in the short term hostile urges, but, but, but I'm not, not so sure. But that's what the New York Times had to say. We have a couple theories about aggression in general. So we have the catalyst model, which says that aggression is due to a combination of things. Okay, it's due to genetic risk, 
the environment, um, stress, and antisocial behavior. Media influences are too weak. They, too weak to have much influence. Okay, so that's the catalyst model. Pretty much saying that it has more to do with uh, genetic risk and the environment, and video games are, are too weak to really have much to do with it at all. And we have the general aggression model. And of course, this is you know, the opposite of the, the catalyst model. It's saying that video games do have an influence on people, on their thoughts, their feelings. Their physical arousal can be affected by, by these games. And that it has both short and long-term effects. And this was where the, one of the few places where I saw someone uh, try to, try to uh, say that. Okay, so they're, they're saying, but it's not, even this article says that the long-term effects are asserted to be possible, but they're not yet accurately determined. Okay, so let's look at some, some numbers, because that's always a, a good way to start a, to, to have a discussion. We need to have, we need to have facts and things we can, we can talk about. So the number of violent youth offenders between 1994 and 2010 fell by half to 224 per 100,000 people in the population. Okay, during that same period of time, more or less, video game sales have more than doubled. So whereas we've seen less acts of aggression by youth, video, games, video game sales have, have soared, they've doubled. Okay, since 1982, there have been 61 mass murders uh, by firearms. And of the 11 deadliest shootings in the US, Five have happened from 2007, since 2007. And there hasn't been some new advancement or some new gaming invention, new, new kind of game since 2007. So this would seem to suggest that the amount of, of, of violence or, or acts of violence carried out is, is not related to, to video games at all, okay? And we have this graph here. We have what well, we can see here. This is um, violent acts, assault deaths per 100,000 people in the population. This is the United States, and then we have several other countries. Okay, so here we are. Yeah. All right. <laughs> deaths by assault. We, we two things that we can conclude. Two things that the U.S. is generally maybe not a more violent country, but they're more violent acts than in other countries. And the death by assault, we can see the death by assault is only slightly higher than 50 years ago. This is 2010, back to 19, 1960, yeah, it's 50 years. In 50 years, it's, it's just about the same. And if we're talking about video games in the way that we can think of them today, I don't know, when would it be the, the 80s that we start to see video games really in the way that we think of them today? 90s even? Yeah. Okay, so... Now, as I said, this is more of a participatory part of the symposium, so hopefully maybe these questions will, will I don't know, spark a bit of a conversation. Um, so I guess I'm interested in uh, the difference between violent content in, in this medium versus other media and why, and why video games always tend to be the scapegoat. That's what I'm interested in. So I don't know if anyone has an opinion about that. What do you think the difference is between violence in video games versus violence in, in movies, for example? Mitch? I think maybe because the video games, the person is more involved, so you're actually the mm -hmm. one doing the violence. You're, that, you're the person shooting or you're the person hitting. While in, media, in other types of media, you're, you're just watching, so you're a little bit distant. So. Yeah. More of a, a passive versus a, an active role. Yeah. yeah. Anyone else? Any other? I mean, so another question would be at, at what point, and I, at what point can violence could be labeled as excessive? But I, that question is kind of redundant, I think, because um, we have video games where you actually you can kill people. I mean, what it can't get much more excessive than that, I guess. There was there was a I think it was Call of Duty, right, where there was a scene where you you were you were the terrorist, right? You were infiltrated into a group of terrorists and you went, in, there was a, a scene where you went into an airport and, you, and terrorists were, were, were shooting a group of civilians in this airport. 
I think that caused a lot of problems. So maybe that's the threshold now, dealing with you know acts of terror or mass killings or things like, probably the mass killings, that certainly touches a, a raw nerve in this country anyway. Um, so what do you think about that? Do you, do you think, why is it okay when you, someone spends three hours a night you know, running around and in a simulation, you know, shooting people, but then when you get to, you know, to mass killings or things like that, it's, it's a difference. What do you think? Uh, I believe that it is very important to set a definition for violence, because if the question is when is violence excessive, the answer is always. The thing, and it's a problem that human beings have all the time to distinguish fiction the reality. So. Uh, Actually, the, the question should be, in which case portraits of violence mm -hmm. are excessive? And here the question is really tricky. I mean, we're walking on a slippery ground because at the end of the day, we're talking about censorship. And we're, ta we're talking about that uh, a media shouldn't portrait or shouldn't talk about a thing. An issue as, let's say, primitive as violence, because you would never say that this novel uh, shouldn't portrait violence. No, no, this novel, no, Frankenstein is so violent, it's pointless. No, and actually the thing, I, I really love the, the example that uh, Tim provided, the comparison between how people in the 19th century saw the new media, the massive novel, that was a, a new thing and a scary thing. It's like, wait a second, everybody, my wife, who is at home, have access, very easy access to this kind of novel. And it is exactly the same situation. And now when we take some perspective and we see each other in the 19th century, um, and we laugh, I mean, because I don't know how many of you have read uh, 19th century uh, detective novels. They are so naive. They have no vi not violence at all, right? I mean, I think any cartoon in the movies is far more violent than in these detective novels, like Sherlock Holmes or, or whatever. So yeah, I think it's a, it's a problem of media demography. This, so it's a sort of uh, evolution. Mm -hmm. A new media, a new medium is always scary. I don't know what people say. Yeah, it's, it, this is the... Yeah, 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 because if the good guy is shooting the bad guy, then that's mm. acceptable, kind of. But if it's you're the bad guy and you're shooting the mm -hmm. civilians, sure. then that... Yeah, it's maybe... It's teaching it a wrong moral code. Okay, so okay, lesson the game's teaching, sure. Yeah. Well, do you think maybe that's a problem with the game, like uh, Grand Theft Auto, for example, right? But I might be wrong again, but generally aren't you some sort of... You're a bad Member of the underworld, right? You're a bad man. Okay. So, do you think that also has anything to do with that? The game's obviously hugely popular, so. Uh, I mean, it, I think it definitely uh, 
it is a cause of why uh, people are so concerned about this. But I think it's, it's not alienated from any other ways of playing. I mean, I don't know. A very common thing was to play cowboys. You are the genocidal cowboy, <laughs> and you are the minority. And who is the bad guy? I mean, both are bad guys, and somebody has to be the bad guy. And actually, that's part of a game, right? So, mm -hmm. uh, red reason, no. I think it's not that exceptional. Video games are not as exceptional. It's more a, as the way we see them. But do you think they are portrayed as exceptional? It's the way the, yeah, the media, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, um, so, yeah, that's probably about it now, so we can yeah, let's stay on time. After uh, Ram's presentation. Yeah, okay, well, thank you.